good evening everybody i welcome you all in this corona third lockdown the time has come to talk on the webinar but at the end of the day i always feel like meeting people those who are in faculty and some of you that we have met in person as well what we are going to discuss today is the bone scalpel and cutting edge technology we have in our webinar dr sajan hegde he is the boss everyone knows he is the one who started the artificial intelligence use in india he is working at the moment chennai and he is our past president of ssi i welcome dr sajan in this webinar and he is going to highlight cases and his videos as well the another eminent faculty is dr ajay prashad sethi he is the surgeon who is from makka of spine surgery that is ganga hospital we have had few occasions of working together and we know he is one of the excellent surgeon too we have another faculty dr bavu garg who is additional professor aims delhi the man who doesn't call in an introduction to like the previous two speakers as well but he is known for his record keeping and he is one of those excellent deformity surgeon as well and i have privilege to introduce my own colleague friend and the every day sort of you know the person whom i talk every day maybe once twice a day dr ajay krishna ajay krishnan he is the one who has probably 3d vision in the deformity work i have seen him operating from 110 degree to near 20 degree kyphotic deformities so we have ajay with ajay krishnan with us so without wasting time i hand over first dr sajan he wanted to speak for few minutes and afterwards we will switch over to dr bavu garg he is going to do the introduction of the bone scalpel and followed by dr ajay prashad sethi who is going to show us cases and the video presentation and followed by sajan dr hegde he is going to talk us about few cases as well and how he uses the bone scalpel and followed by pros and cons of this new technology bone scalpel by dr ajay krishnan and at the end i will conclude with the aerosol and how do we prevent this aerosol generation or how do we sort of protect ourselves from this aerosol so over to sajan sajan i have unmute you good evening uh, gentlemen so it's a pleasure to be here this is in fact my first webinar so i have kept the corona virus away from me and i have also kept the webinar virus away from me but uh, uh when bharat called me and said why don't you take part uh, uh when we are talking about uh, the 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 uh, ultrasonic scalpel it excited me it excited me because uh, i feel uh, it is uh, the tool that all of us need to have it whether we like it or not and uh, uh, when i first saw it maybe some 8 9 years ago uh, at some conference in europe and this guy was able to remove the top of the egg shell without disturbing the egg yolk it fascinated me how it could be done and uh, we i think we were the first to get this tool in this part of the world uh, initially we didn't understand its applications but today as i will show you it has replaced most of our standard tools and uh, it it is something that we use every day uh, thank you bharat for having me as part of this webinar thank you very much well i must thank you for accepting and coming over on this web 
uh, webinar, you know, I must thank you. I really am feel, you know, honored that you have, you know, accepted our invite. Now I request Dr. Babuk to take over. I think I have unmuted you. You can start, Babuk, please. Good evening, Dr. Sajan, Dr. Ajoy, and Dr. Ajay Krishnan. Good evening. Good evening. Can they hear us? Yeah. Yeah. So I will be covering the, the basics of uh, UBS. Uh, we know it's a, it's a novel ultrasonic surgical device. And we all know that it cuts bones and spares the soft tissues, which are very important when we talk about the, uh, the spine surgery, like dura and the neurovascular structures. It also has a relative selectivity for bone destruction. And why is it so? We will discuss as we go along. And recently, this tool has been promoted as ideal for spine surgeries. And why is it so? We will just see. So this is the usual assembly. Um, it has got a generator. It has got a tubing which connects it to the hand piece. And the hand piece bears the, the, the work, terminal working piece. So basically, if we look at the ultrasonic assembly, it's a generator or the irrigation console. Uh, it basically amplifies the electrical signal and converts into a high back and forth motion of a blunt blade at the extremely high frequency of around 22,000 times per second. The working tip, it can either be in the form of a blade, which comes in different lengths, usually in around 10 to 20 millimeter in length and 0.5 to 1 millimeter in width. And it works basically as an ultrasonic osteotome. While if you look at the burr and the shaver, they are the non-rotating burr for the bone and they basically ablate the bone whenever they come in touch with the, with the bone. So this is like the usual amplitude. You can see that the, uh, the, uh, the, the blade, it comes forth and it, there is an amplitude and this blade goes forth and back in this amplitude. And uh, I will show just a video that how does it move. So basically this is the, this movement which creates the, uh, the, the uh, final transfer of energy to the bone. If we compare the, the ultrasonic bone scalper to the traditional methods, like the high-speed burrs, the problem with high-speed burrs is that there is a considerable vibration and torque, and which creates a weed waker phenomena. We will just see what is weed waker phenomena. And if we look at the osteotomes, so osteotomes, it also uh, uh, provides energy transfer from the osteotome to the bone, but there is a risk of plunging into the neurovascular structures. And problem with carissons are the fatigue, the manual fatigue, which we surgeons all know that if we have to remove a lot of bone, that it can lead to you know the fatigue failure of, of your, your hand as well. So this is the, the normal burr, we know. It can create so much uh, rotatory force and it can entangle the, uh, the, the neurovascular structures. While the, if you look at the, the ultrasonic scalpel, so it takes out the bone as end block because of this two and fourth motion. It exactly works like an osteotome, but here the energy transfer is much more stable and in much more uh, small uh, uh, transfer, small, small amount of transfer. While the burrs, they, they, they ablate the bone whenever they come in contact. So this is like the weed waker phenomena. You can see that when you move the burr, then it can also take out the, the surrounding uh, the, the structures into, into this uh, destruction. So there is always a risk of getting the uh, important neurovascular structures get entangled into the, into the burr. While this is just a small video that how does it work, this ultrasonic bone scalpel. So there is uh, usually 50 to 60 hertz of electrical activity which is transferred to the ultrasonic generator. Then this ultrasonic generator transfers uh, it through the piezoelectric mechanism, transfers to the two and fourth motion, which is approximately in the range of 22,500 um, uh, uh, oscillations per minute. And then there is a, um, a fluid channel inside it. And this fluid channel actually gives the, uh, makes, it, makes the, the tip of the working instrument cool, which is very essential because this high, this um, high uh, oscillation rate makes it very hot. This tip of this, so one surgeon has to be very careful whenever he's working that the he's careful about the extreme thermal uh, energy at the tip. So obvious uses they are in facetectomies. You can use them for laminotomies, the laminectomies, and block resection of the bone. You can use it for them the Smith Peterson osteotomies or the pedicle suppression osteotomy. So these are various uses, common uses. There are other uses as well. So why does it have so much selectivity for bone? Because it transfers a large amount of energy within a small amount of bone at the point of contact. And the soft tissue structures, because they have the capacity to bend, deform, or move away or vibrate upon contact with the blade, so they dampen the energy transfer. However, it is not absolute. If you keep the, the, uh, the tip of the, the instrument very long in contact, which is usually around 10 seconds, then it can um, 
danger, then it can damage the, the structures as well. So one has to be very careful when they are using this ultrasonic bone scalpel. So when we talk about the bone cutting technique, we can see that this is a three step process. So in the fir first step, you just go, you just cut the, the uh, upper cortex, the, the, the near cortex. So you just give a small, small lateral movements with little actual pressure, pressure to score the outer cortex of the bone to be cut. While in the, in the second phase, when you enter into the cancellous area, then you give more actual pressures and then you can literally liberally, you can lateral sweep to cut through the cancellous bone because it is very soft. And then finally, when you reach the inner cortex, then again, you make short lateral swipes with controlled cyclical forward and backward movement to penetrate the inner bone cortex. So this is the C step that the third step is the most crucial because here you can, you have to develop this tactile feel to feel for the inner cortex uh, uh, breaking away or the giving away. So advantages are that it, it's a high precision uh, cutting uh, instrument. You can uh, cut the bone in any shape, uh, whatever the shape you want. So your osteotomy means they can be precise. You can measure the perfect angle. There is a, a ample literature now that there's a notable reduction in the osseous bleeding because it coagulates the small venules at the surface of the bone. Obviously, there is a safety towards dura, which we just discussed. And then as compared to the burr, when there is a lot of bone debris, which goes away, you can have a lot of autograft, you know, so you can use it for your fusion purposes. So this is just a paper which I've taken and you can see that the, the shape of the osteotomy is they are perfect. They, they, they are highly precise. And there are ample literature now regarding the blood loss uh, reduction also during the, uh, the uh, AIS surgeries as well. Now this is just a small uh, video you can see here that we are cutting, that we are cutting. And you can see we as a spine surgeon, whoever, whosoever is doing osteotomy, he knows that there is so much bleeding at this step when they are going through this osteotomy. But with ultrasonic scalpel, you can see that there's hardly any bleeding when you're doing this particular subtraction osteotomy. These are just some of the examples, you know, uh, where we have done so much osteotomies with very much little blood loss when we, when we use this ultrasonic scalpel. Like this was a three-year-old boy where we had many concerns because the whole blood volume is just uh, less than one liter or 1.2 liters in this uh, age group. And uh, we know that this child needs vertebral column resection. And when we did vertebral column resection with using this ultrasonic scalpel, you can see uh, this uh, scalpel in the, in the, in the uh, intraoperative x-rays. So the whole blood loss was less than 400 ml in, in the whole surgery in this child. So again, the, uh, the another advantage is that you can use cottonoids, which is not possible with the, uh, with the burr when you are using burrs. Uh, there are ample literature that it takes less operative time. There is a learning curve is quite short. As per the literature, you just need 15 cases to be master of this, uh, this technique. And uh, we have also seen that whenever we have taken bone graft uh, from the islet crest using this ultrasonic bone scalpel, so there is a less pain. So the theory is that it also destroys the nerves endings at the, um, at the edges of the bone, at the periosteum. So again, there is less pain. So we, this we have uh, witnessed in our many cases. So we take uh, bone graft using this ultrasonic scalpel. One has to avoid plunging to the dura because if there is an unduly force on the dura, it can damage the dura as, as such. One should avoid lingering over the dura less than uh, more than 10 seconds. And one has to be very careful when you're using this device, when the dura is likely to be adherent. There are techniques, uh, I, I'm sure we can discuss them. Uh, when the dura is adherent, then you have to use this device very carefully. So the tips are, you have to develop a tactile feel so you can practice on a bone model beforehand. You can palpate with scalpel off. So when you're reaching the inner cortex, you can always feel that you have, that with the scalpel off, whether you have breached the inner cortex or not. Always, always plan your cuts to be made before uh, and divide the work into smaller parts. Also, you know, one of the advantages is that you can take a large piece of bone with this, but it is always better to divide your work into smaller parts. So that, again, there are less chances of injury. You need some time for developing tactile feel. Again, 12 to 15 cases, they are good enough. You need to pre-plan to the cut the bones in advances. Special caution you have to take in revision cases because the dura may be adherent to the bone. Overheating, so again, you have to continue to move the device and not net it bind in one position. And high cost is, is certainly uh, one of the major downside which people talk about. But if you look at the longer term, then it is much more cost effective. Thank you. Thank you, Bhavu. Um, do we have, uh, we will take the questions at the end or we can take right now? We will have the question in the chat. We'll have the question in the chat. So at that time, you know, we can have that. Is that okay?
Bharat, can I share my screen now? Ajoy? Yeah, can I share my screen? You are live, so you can start your talk, please. And yeah. if there are any questions, if you can put it in the chat box, we will cover them at the end. Uh, I'm going to Bharat, put start. your questions in the chat box. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to show a few cases of uh, where we are used ultrasonic bone scalpel. I mean, but unfortunately, I don't have intraoperative pictures. Uh, this is a patient uh, with a adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. As you can see, the main thoracic curve is about 107 degrees. And uh, we applied a halo traction to this particular child for a period of four to six weeks and uh, around six weeks. And you, you can see the deformity has corrected to about 83 degrees. And on the lateral view, uh, she is hypokyphotic. And therefore, this is a situation, the major concern in uh, scoliosis surgery, especially when the rigidity of the curve is significantly more, and when a curve reaches about 100 degrees, is the blood loss. And especially most of these children uh, with age group of 12 to 13 years are look so, uh, their blood, body weight itself is low and the blood volume itself is less. I mean, basically we depend upon the anesthetic technique. We use tranosmic acid to reduce the blood loss. But in spite of all strategies, the blood loss is significantly high. As Bauk mentioned, one of the important contributors to the blood loss is the uh, osteotomy and the decortication side and the venous blood loss. Therefore, in a situation like this, this is similar to the article. I take it, took it from the article which Bauk showed. Uh, um, basically, as you can see, by using the ultrasonic bone cutter, you can do a facetectomy quite safely without any major issues. The blood loss becomes significantly lesser. This is again from that article where they have done a V osteotomy. I do a slightly varied uh, modification of that, but it helps you to do a ponte osteotomy much more liberally, number one. And number two, the amount of blood loss, especially when you do in a scoliosis on the convex side, the blood loss is significantly higher. Therefore, the amount of blood loss that tends to happen becomes significantly less. And uh, Fortunately for this girl, at the end of the procedure, when we were able to achieve a good degree of correction, both in the coronal and the sagittal plane, the blood loss was only about 500 ml with all, all the uh, magnitude of surgery what she underwent. And this is similar to the experience. If you see the literature, this is one of the articles in the retrospective cohort, which they are mentioning in 2000, published in 2019, where there are 84 scoliosis patients and they compared the UBS versus the traditional instruments like osteotome and Kerison Ronja for ponte osteotomy and facetectomy. And they noticed there's a significant reduction in the normalized blood loss that is for the patient's weight and body weight, and more so in the neuromuscular group as against the AAS group. As we are all aware, in the neuromuscular group, the blood loss is significantly higher. Similarly, one more article which was published way back, and they had initially looked at and they said the blood loss is less, it's about 30 to 40 percent. Therefore, this highlights the usage of an ultrasonic bar or ultrasonic cutting device in this use during the uh, various spinal procedures. I mean, we use it for everything, in starting from a cervical corpectomy to a cervical laminectomy to a deformity correction, as as Bauk showed, even for a osteotomy and even for a decompression scenario when you're doing a telif, it's easy to remove the facets using a Masonic uh, bone cutter. I'll show you one more example of a 65-year-old lady who presented to us with a cervical myelopathy and uh, significant uh, neurological dysfunction. As you can see, there is an extensive OPLL, which is extending from C5 to T1. And unfortunately, she also had a OLL, which was extending mainly at uh, uh, T3-4 level. Therefore, it, she did an osteotomy, which was and as you can see, even at the C3 field level, there is an ossification that is bound to happen. Therefore, we plan to extend our uh, laminectomy from C3 down to towards T5-6 level. But as you can understand, it's a surgery of greater magnitude. You cross over the cervi cervicothoracic junction. It needs an instrumentation. And any osteotomy can add to an excess of blood loss. This is taken from the Masonic literature. And this is what you do. You basically use a cutting one 
and you can cut through and through. And as you can see, we are able to do an instrumentation for T3 to C3 to T5 with a very minimal amount of blood loss, uh, which led to an eventual good outcome. And this is published by Bharat, where they did an analysis of 311 patients, and they observed that the blood loss was significantly lesser. There's a minimal injury to the soft tissue, excellent device control, excellent visibility, enhanced accuracy, and it's a versatile tube. I mean, the amount of uh, bone destruction is significantly lesser, and you can do it with more precise uh, nature. As Bauk mentioned, these are the three techniques that is used. First, you start with the lateral movement for the outer cortex. You go with the axial pressure and the liberal, go it through and through, like anteroposterior movement to the cancellous mid portion. And then you do the final cut with a controlled cyclical motion. What we do in majority of the scenario is that sometimes I use a burp within the outer cortex and the uh, mm -hmm. part of the, um, the cancellous bone. And then I use the osteotome to do the, I mean, uh, the mesonic cutter to do, do the final cut. Or the other option is you can use the cutter up to the inner cortex. And there you can use a thin osteotome. Once you have weakened the inner cortex, rather than going through and through, you can put an osteotome inside that gap and gently by rotating it tends to break. That's a way to prevent a dural tear, especially in situations when it is uh, significantly adherent. I will just show the video. This is a video done by Bharat when he came to our hospital and I'll show the way he has done this particular procedure. Basically, he has done the discectomy above and below. This is a carpectomy video. As you can see, see now is going with a forward movement. See the amount of the irrigation is necessary to prevent the heat. And you need to have a blade of a much longer length so that you can perform carpectomy much, much safer. You get a feel of sensation as you are reach, reaching the anterior cortex, as you are cut through the cancellous bone. That is the anterior rather than the posterior cortex in this particular scenario. I need a. No, no, I'm going. Uh, I just showed. This is what I meant. You can use an osteotone to complete the break, and you can appreciate the movement that is happening. For doing this procedure, especially quite comfortably, you have to be sure. Come on, completely. Wow, you can see that. Yes, with the PLL. Okay, this is, you can hear Bharat's voice also. I'm not taking credit for it. I told Bharat I'm going to send him the video. This is another way of doing, especially in uh, OLF, which I do it. I tend to use the burr initially to thin the cortex. As you can see, I'm doing overall thinning on either side. And then I use the osteotome to do the final part of the cutting. I gently cut it so that when you are doing the chances that you can separate the dura, which is adherent to the OLF, is uh, significantly better. You can see if you are not irrigated, you, you get a huge amount of heat that is generated. And if you try to dip it, Inside, if you by accidentally dipping inside, it can cause a dural tear, especially in a patient who has got an addition between the dura and the part of the bone. I said first started using with the burr, but now I use most of the time the cutter. See, there is a difference between this and the sonopate are the other type of things, I mean, which they use for intradural work. That basically works by uh, what is called as uh, the cavitation mechanism. And this basically what we use tend to work by the use of uh, fragmentation techniques. Uh, thank you, Bharat. And uh, that's all it's about from my side.
Bharat, you can hear me? Yeah, sure, sure. I can. And basically, I use your video to show how you do it. You go through and through, and Ajay go through and through. I tend to use the bird for the outer cortex and the part of the medulla, and then uh, I tend to use the mesonics in the latter later part to make the final cut. Especially when I am using it for a ossified ligamentum flavum. And even when I am using it for a cervical amnesty. But when I am using it to do a uh, facetectomy, I use it through and through. It's much more controlled. But I always tend to complete my final cut with an ostetome put inside and gently rotating it so that the chance of dural tear becomes significantly lesser. Sure. Thank you. Uh, I think let us uh, see from the uh, Dr. Sajan's end what he does and how he does it. And uh, Sajan, you can take your time. Uh, I'll just unmute you. Yeah, you're, you're live now, Sajan. Uh, so, uh, they were, uh, the, the, the presentations from Bhavok and uh, Ajoy were absolutely excellent. And uh, they addressed uh, quite a few issue, uh, uh, things that we can do with the with the ultrasonic scalpel. Uh, I just wanted to add to Bhavok's uh, presentation is that when you start using the ultrasonic scalpel, you have to be very, very patient. And th there is no place for aggressive movements. And you use the tool like a paintbrush. And when you use it like a paintbrush, it's, a, it, it's an extremely versatile tool and it is uh, as Bauk said you have to develop a tactile sense and uh, when there is a giveaway when you have gone through the bone it's very important how how you uh, how you develop this sense this feel with 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 the with, with the tool so now i'm uh, it's almost similar to the case that uh, joy showed uh, so we will just quickly show you a few things. So uh, Ajoy knows very well uh, that uh, I, he is, of course, many years younger. But we all grew up with these tools, which are our favorite tools. Uh, almost 80 to 90 percent of our work was done with the tools that you see on the side, the carisons, rongers, and the osteotomes. In fact, I have uh, to show a carpal tunnel on both sides because of excessive use of rongers and, uh, of course, putting the screws uh, uh, manually. This is all changing for the younger spine surgeons. Uh, but today, we do not use... Uh, we do not use the at all. Almost uh, in my practice, it has come down by almost 60 to 70 percent. And correspondingly, the use of the of the uh, tool has gone up. Uh, I mean, the uh, ultrasonic scalpel has gone up. So it, as they showed, uh, as the previous speakers showed, you can use it for a variety of conditions, like this patient who at classical cervical myelopathy and neuric grade five. And you can see here, he has multi-level compression. Now, when they have a normal good lordosis, we prefer to do a laminectomy from the back and sometimes stabilize them as well. Uh, in the past, this used to take a long time Today, with the ultrasonic scalpel, it takes hardly uh, about 15 minutes for the entire uh, uh, decompression to be done. And it is extremely safe. One thing I would like to point out I, uh, is that you should never stop. As Bauk said, you cannot put pressure for more than 10 seconds. And once there is a giveaway, you have to immediately bring it behind because the thermal uh, uh, the thermal energy that is created can create a tear in the dura. Uh, so here you see typically how we would do uh, a laminectomy. 
We just got this model uh, yesterday just to show how we do this. And is, it is as quick as it, as it, as it is seen here. <laughs> so you mark it out and then you run across and gently go as it gives way. And once you have done this, uh, uh, you gently lift the lamina uh, and tease, tease it out, remove the adhesions between it and the dura. And that's all. So that's how quickly you can do it. And uh, so, th and then you can, you know, you, you, you do your decompression and fix it. Uh, Bahu, uh, Joy showed this case we had a similar uh, case, but this is where I want to show you the extensive use of uh, the ultrasonic scalpel. So <clears throat> like they do in Ganga, we also prefer to put our patients on traction. Uh, one thing I hate doing is a VCR for these, for these patients. I do not like to do a VCR uh, to correct these deformities. I'd rather do it in the safest way possible. I do not like uh, uh, bleeding of more than 300 or 400 ml. And that's what we do. We put them on traction and uh, we correct them over, uh, over, over four, six to eight weeks, sometimes four to six weeks, definitely. So here you see the patient has a very severe deformity, 118 degrees, and we, we start the traction. And uh, here you can see serially how she corrects over the, over the weeks. Again, in these extreme severe cases, I prefer not to put my screws in the most concave part of the deformity, I prefer to use bands, which is again safer. So here you see we are using the robot uh, to fit the screws. So it is use of the latest technologies to, to do this type of surgery. We, we do a paraoperative uh, screen. As you, can, as you know that we prefer to do it on uh, traction. So we correct them further and then do the, here the zeme is uh, taking the view views. And once that is done, we, we, we feed them into the robot and uh, it, it becomes quicker, it becomes safer and you get your screws in a much more precise manner than how, uh, how you would have done otherwise. And once it is done, uh, the robot is used and uh, the screws are fixed at the levels that you want to. And once you have done that, uh, you are, uh, you, you then do your osteotomies in the most severe part of the deformity. This is huge. The way it uh, prevents blood loss when you're doing this, when you're, when you're using the clinician, there is always the possibility of pressure and you can do this quickly at multiple levels and uh, you can go on. And then, uh, we also, in this particular ch uh, child, she had a very sharp uh, gibbous. So we use uh, the ultrasonic scalpel to, to do the uh, rib resection. Again, it's, it is much safer. It, there is much less blood loss. And you are able to do it in a much cleaner manner, and you get the bone for for the graft. So you so 
So that's how you do the resection and uh, the instrumentation. You can see the two bands in place. This uh, deformity of 118 was reduced to maybe around 20 degrees. And that's how she looks after surgery. So it's all about safety and reducing blood loss and doing it in a more precise manner. And I think for today's surgeon, uh, uh, the ultrasonic scalpel, he cannot do without it. If I don't think any spine work can be done without, uh, without having this. So I'm going to show again in revision lumbar spine surgery, this again is a 60 year old, came with severe radiculopathy. There are a lot of people now doing endoscopic uh, discectomies and all that. I'm sure we will see a lot of them come back for surgery. And uh, uh, this is not to say that endoscopic doesn't work, but perhaps in a number of cases, it's not going to give the desired relief. So this patient, as you can see, has a very gentle uh, listhesis of L4 over L5, you can see the severe uh, compression at L4-5. And the osteotomy, and we always do the CT Milo, which again shows the compression and the reason for his radicular pain, you can see it here. And uh, we, this is the osteotomy that I prefer to do. I often don't expose on the other side I expose only on one side. And uh, these are the typical osteotomies that we perform. So one is to remove the facet. That is osteotomy number one. And once you have done that and the facet comes loose, and as you know, uh, when you do this, you have a lot of bone that you can use for graft. And then you, this is osteotomy number two. We do not remove ever the midline. We make the osteotomy. Yeah, I'm sorry. This is osteotomy number two. As you can see, it's at the base of the spinous process and the lamina. And once we have removed that, then we are able to do whatever we want to do, the interbody fusion and everything. And screws in place. These are put uh, using the robot and the cage. Uh, there will come a time when the ultrasonic scalpel will fit onto the robot and that will be the future. We will be able to do osteotomies, perhaps even indirectly, not even visualizing it directly. So that's how we will do it. A great tool for ossified ligamentum flavum, especially in the thoracic spine, when you have multiple uh, compression, this patient came with paraparesis, plastic paraparesis. And when you want to remove these, this is perhaps one of the most difficult surgeries one can do. The burrs that uh, are available with the ultrasonic scalpel are wonderful tools to remove this pressure and minimize the dural tears. Some amount of dural uh, opening is always, will always happen when you do these type of surgeries. That is it. So essentially, those are the few things that I wanted to show. This is a very versatile tool. It needs uh, one to be patient to learn. One has to use it like a paintbrush. It is a tech, it's a tactile feel that one has to develop. Its applications are amazing. And I think it, it will be something that all of us will have to have in our armamentarium. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Sadin, great talk, and I think you, you have demonstrated very well on the bone models. Now we move on to Dr. Ajay Krishnan's talk, and he's going to talk on the pros and cons. If you can uh, just stop the slide share, please. 
Yeah. Now to Dr. Ajay Krishnan. Practical things are what you want to take up from any presentation, any talk. Uh, pros and cons. I've removed few slides. Like these are the routine slides which have already been talked and many of the literature has been covered by Bauk and uh, 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 Shetty also. Uh, so, so clearly it says that the heat production is less and doesn't cause mechanical injury. So that is basically what it causes and the lowest risk of Dural injury is also being reported. These numbers are less. 52 number, 52 cases in this series. They reported only one case of a dural injury. So, and indirectly, you are gaining on the blood loss uh, also. In nutshell, I removed all the presentations which were all the literature which was on the uh, time gain or shortening the duration. But it really matters when you reduce the time. And you can think why. You have come across many of your teachers. Actually, when you are in the institute, you have seen your teachers. You have seen many surgeons working together. And then you have seen that a person who is gifted to a surgery, do a surgery more meticulously and has spent hours doing that meticulous may end up achieving a poorer result. So that is the cases wherein the result does get influenced by the duration of surgeries and extensive surgeries, elderly surgeries, pediatric surgeries, this makes immense difference. So we should know where speed matters. For an example, to just cover up, this is one of the patients we did long back and it was the first surgery done uh, for yeah, a year. Yeah. Hello? I think your slideshow is not coming. Okay, I'll go back. is wrong. Let's start again. Yeah. Sorry. So yeah. I'll skip through the slides. I'll just cut through the literature which is there and uh, uh, I removed many slides. So basically it reduces the dural tears significantly, the blood loss significantly already talked about the safety increases, the time gain, that is what I was talking about. The gained time is very much significant when you are talking about patients who are elderly, you are doing osteotomies, which would reduce your time by say 20, 30, 40%. It would make immense difference to the anesthesia. Pediatric patient as bowel cold, it is of great importance, significant importance. This is one of the cases which I would just say, a patient who presented with a GO score of nine, and we did a conventional surgery at that time, long back in 2011 or something. And therein, it took nearly 115 minutes to complete the surgery. And after the surgery, this was with conventional instruments. And we had a worsened neurology, which we took nearly three months to recover again back to nearly GR2. And he was a police inspector. Again, we had this patient three years down line with a proximal stenosis with a further worsening of the neurology, though he was a near normal with a grade score of one or two. And then we again operated this patient and this patient was operated by a laminectomy and block with mesonic. And this time, the time was just 55 minutes. It's not the time which is there. We didn't have a deficit this time. Though we could retain that patient in spite of that complication, but we gave a comparative uh, picture in a redo surgery you are gaining say nearly 55 minutes for a surgery it's a complete skin to skin talk time what i am talking in a 55 minutes time we finished the surgery off which took nearly two hours for the primary conventional surgery so it's the hand saved it's the money saved it is the energy saved it is more focused work you are able to do so these were all numbers which is not which, which are there 300 this is a large series which again there 307 patients and again the duration of the surgery, the blood, uh, blood replacement has significantly been reduced. We have an unpublished submitted evaluation. We have just submitted, which was comparative. That's why I'm just quoting it here. It is 55 patients, uh, handheld traditional instrument surgery and another 45 bone scalpel uh, based surgery for only thoracic spinal stenosis between 2004 and 2014. 
and in that group the demography was nearly same and most of them were the ossifying legions the total operative time reduction was nearly 22 percent with a per segment reduction by nearly 30 percent and the length of hospital stay reduced would be indirect because the number of dural tears the number of dural deficits are reduced so it was uh, important and the blood loss is quite significant and it was statistically significant as well and the neurological uh, worsening and the dural uh, tears they were also on an average reduced as compared to the conventional surgeries but it was statistically insignificant this is the data what i am we have submitted is 2014 so after that period once we have crossed over that learning curve the incidences have significantly more reduced so this is just to quote and complete and we are nearly now 1800 900 surgeries which we have done and it uh, com uh, it covers the entire spectrum the absolute indications what i would say is this group of patients here and if you do a surgery then that's the day you won't like to do another surgery after this or even a deformity surgery is fine but after a surgery like this you do for a fluorosis you don't want to do any even an opd that day so here is the group of patients wherein it will make an immense difference because we face a lot of patients of fluorosis and ossifying disorders wherein you have done an entire spinotomy, what we call, say, triple region stenosis, significantly ossifying fluorosis there, wherein we are able to finish off the job in, say, two, three hours, a triple region surgery, which we were not able to do, say, six, seven, eight hours with even, even a two team there. So that's the way, that's the cases where you need an absolute, uh, absolutely uh, uh, must, must for mesonic and as talked for all other dorsal pathologies, for all cases of OPLLs and things, it does work wonders. This is an, again another indication which we have found with the technology what we have. For upper dorsal uh, kyphosis, I have nearly stopped doing any deformity corrections because these group of patients don't come to me for deformity, but they per se come for a worsening neurology in a month or few months time. So I have started doing only gibectomies for this group of patients and wherein you used to do a circumferential decompression by a bilateral approach initially, but now with this mesonic in, with the, the 3D navigation and OAM what I have, I can do it more precise and we can more plan it. We can sculpt and we can exactly identify. This is the reference frame which is there and with the reference frame and the probe, we are able to actually locate where we want to uh, remove, what we want to remove. And this is a T incision on one side, which we did with a uh, one rib removed here. You can actually flatten the uh, uh, approach with the mesonic. And this is the 3D, uh, the, 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 this is the navigated frame, which is for the third party navigation. And you can cut through the osteotome there. And this is something which is to be looked on this on the right side image. You are using this osteotome or say mesonic just adjacent to the cord and cutting across through the body. So this is the image word. This you cannot do with any of the other instruments and I have not I've never been able to do it. At least with burr you can even imagine. Yes, you can use a protected hooded burr to do a bit of the job but not really. So this is what I was talking about for internal gabectomy. You remove and remove a part of the bone from inside, keeping a good shell and enough bone of the vertebral body remaining there. So with this trough created, you create this lab with cutting of this vertical cut. This is the most important cut, which can be done only with this mesonic. And once that is cut, you can just push this uh, bone into the gap created and you can get away with uh, an internal gabectomy easy. And all the bone that is preserved is again used uh, as a bed because the more you remove you are not left with a lot of bone uh, bed that's why you need more number of screws so i you started using say two four screws for single level fixation and in these cases you are able to get away and this is already we have published but this is with other uh, uh, technological advances say oarm navigation ionm everything is there more additional indications which you can think about is Say, uh, Shetiza would like to, uh, maybe using it definitely because he uses the spinous splitting process, spinous process splitting decompression. So here it would be working excellently. Uh, you can use for routine surgeries, uh, like any other case for high volume centers. For transforaminal endoscopies, 
we have been struggling since years to remove the bone which we remove by say burr but in this cases if we have some tool which is so small to reach near the lateral recess this would be the thing which would make remarkable successful stenosis surgery for transforaminal surgery and already there are some probes but they are all in the process of further evolution uh, and exactly what the difference it makes can be understood by the orthopedic surgeons who were be doing traditional plaster cutting the difference it made with a plaster cutter which was motorized that's exactly the difference which you get by uh, using a mesonic in a any surgery just for a sake of comp a comparison i would just show this video this video is actually showing two burrs one is a conventional burr this we have three burrs with us and this is the uh, asculeb burr which is there we started together both sided fenestration to be done this is the burr of the mesonic this needs continuous irrigation there and it is going its work and this is using a self irrigated burr this is not a cutting tip what i am showing and after it has been finished still you have a lot of things to be done there and it is already there and removed the ligamentum flame it is it, it will not detach or remove the ligamentum flame i am not talking about the cutting burr tip i am not talking of the osteotome so uh, uh, like uh, anna or shetty was uh, talking about that he uses the last cut very carefully with the osteotome you can use this burr tip because with this burr tip you are not even uh, endangering that just Uh, tip off into the canal so this can be used when you are thinking of the decompressive part whenever you need though we are more aggressive to remove it and block these are the publications which you already cited we have three four publications on this already i just went into to look into it why why it is not being used into the uh, routine neurosurgical uh, centers and other centers i could quote back as back as 40s or 50s when already this system was there in existence and the maxillofacial surgeons the dental surgeons use it more profusely and they are using it significantly with all the mentioned advantages what we were talking about and few of the literature because this is cosmetic surgery so they even end up comparing the post operative edemas to the uh, to, uh, to the face to define the outcome so in these group of patients of comparative outcomes of conventional surgeries and using the other cutting burrs when they are able to compare the pre operative the post operative baseline the one week after surgery they are able to make significant difference when mesonic is used so we don't have any studies as of now to define the edema of the musculature what we cut through to reach to the spine neither we are able to define say the edema difference of the cord pre operatively and post operatively because we have a stenosed cord and we are not able to identify the extent of that edema and it combines with the myelomalacia but for the surgeries of other branches it significantly uh, matters in the outcome what they are comparing and this is the osteotomy this is leifort's osteotomy we'll just skip it so is it all good say we are talking about something which can increase the rashness of an orthopedic surgeon because we are always blamed as being surgeon and super surgeons we all have uh, uh, passed our hostel life and everybody would spot that this is the orthopedic guy is coming he is hopeless and the reason has been the rashness the aggressiveness probably which was there and this is again a tool which can increase your rashness and it can label you again in some way in the wrong way so you should be cautious as well and you have to use it with a feather touch as dr hegde uh, told and uh, just to compare like ultrasonic bone scalpel is what we use and what probably everybody is using there have been comparisons with other uh, uh, system also like what uh, what is a bit, uh, with a uh, sonic uh, the, 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 the other models which is the striker models the sonar the zurich so what they say is that there is some amount of heat production in mesonic is probably more but it doesn't make a clinical difference as to what we have noticed clinically this is another thing which we have noticed we have already published this we have uh, a report of significant number of cases of pneumocephalus at our institute for a varied group of surgeries and in this say so this is the post operative mri of the patient already operated by a laminectomy and two days down the patient starts complaining and then you have got your mri done and you are seeing the pneumocephalus there so we have started scratching our brain for the pneumocephalus also that is there the bubbles generated by the uh saw 
increasing any propensity towards pneumococcus but it is not happening with all cases looking to the number of cases what we have and and it is not the reason but we have started scratch, uh, scratching uh, uh, to find any reasons and hand safety as yes, your hand is saved by not using conventional instruments but is it really saving because uh, these are pneumatic instruments whatever you are using the pneumatic instruments are bound to create vibrations and they create problems in your hand neuropathy carpal tunnel syndrome as dr hegde also said he he has bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome i would also say the number of cases which i am doing i see i feel when the duration of surgery increases you feel some lethargy in your hands and now what has happened in the last one year as that i have changed the size of my gloves by half and i have just climbed which didn't happen so many years so there is something with the volume of the cases which you are doing which is still not reported there you may end up having small things uh, uh, by repeated non uh, say say so for simpler surgeries if you are using it and you are using it for right and right in and out then you may get those type of problems as well uh, this was again i tried to find out any other uh, problems because of the ultrasound and there have been good amount of publications on the atmospheric ultrasonic vibrations or uh, waves which are passing because there are many instruments which are uh, emitting these ultrasonic uh, waves and that leads to a lot of concentration problems annoyance even there have been reports of say uh, complaints of uh, vomiting say nausea sensations lethargy these are all reported this all is there but this is not related to mesonic this is just i try to find out the what is there in the atmosphere for ultrasound generators in different uh, uh, field and there i have been able to find this even the wall street journal has quoted can ultrasonic noise make you sick so this is talked about thing so to just sum up the advantages and the disadvantage or the pros and cons tool for cutting it is precise definitely it gives you speed and it reduces the blood loss directly and indirectly with e easy usage with cottonite and bone grafts is the thing which you can retrieve and osteo integration because the if you are doing a laminoplasty and placing it back because the gap created is too low there are high chances that the osteo integration can also occur better so that is another thing the learning curve is definitely lesser because for us to learn that finer uh, burr based used that that took more time to learn than this so uh, this is definitely on the shorter learning curve dural and neural safety is there with an x factor of say dural tear for specific indications when we are using say for for all adhesions and calcifications of dura so there you have to be safe there is a definite role for diseases like fluorosis and ossifying disorders and osteotomy and in child whenever you are doing an osteotomy and in child especially with uh, what bau told you need to actually save blood and high volume centers you can definitely speed up things edema infection pain pain as bau told about that the pain de decreases significantly we have observed that and indirectly you may be reducing the infections and the edema because you are reducing the time the retraction time the handling time anesthesia complication itself you are reducing the length of the hospital stay is reducing and the cost to the patient probably indirectly may be reduced and coming to the disadvantages if you want to yes this needs a feedback to be developed to make it more safer and you prevent that tip of what uh, shetty was talking about and additions ossifications in revisions you have to be careful planning of osteotomies because once you have cut you cannot do anything so you need to plan where exactly you want to place it because with a burr you are just progressively moving here you are just cut off and you can create mistakes so you should be very much clear on that hand piece ergonomics is not as good as that of the burrs which we have evolved because burrs are more finer and one thing to be just mentioned the burrs we use like a pen this we use like a trumpet so this is a different way of using so ergonomics actually coming into our way is not there but definitely it will improve with time it can be rash if you are aggressive and typical nature of a surgeon and orthopedic surgeon it can land you in problem be safe feather touch dr hegde already mentioned it cost of mbbs mba mbs it doesn't make any big difference when you are comparing with a burr itself so it doesn't cost much of a uh, cost rise yes professional hazard we may be sitting on one but be safe in spine surgery and ubs does make a very big difference and it is safe thank you
thank you, Ajay. Um, let me, if you can stop the share screen. Yeah, just a minute. Yeah, sure. Done. Yeah. Uh, let me conclude few things, particularly related to the arousal generation. That is what I have looked into. And uh, how do we really circumvent that? Uh, that's what I have few things to share with you. And uh, then after that, we will have the discussion. Um, what is arousal? Well, it's a day-to-day -day we use, particularly uh, when you look at a lot of things, you know, which we use for the uh, spray that is in the household, even the fly, even the mosquito, they all have the arousal. But it can turn out to be quite dangerous in the operation theater because this arousal generated with this pottery and the tools which we use, they can have the organisms and this high speed organ or high, high speed uh, birds can really make it cloud uh, in the in the operation theater. The household use of the aerosols, they usually have the formaldehyde and xylene and they are harmful if you stay them, you know, stay around them for a long time. Uh, what are the tools that seen in the spine surgery? They are electropottery, power drill, power burr and even the suction that can also cause this. Uh, in our day-to-day -day activity, considering to this COVID, I think we should be considering intubation and extubation that generates the aerosol. And that is why room cleaning is given a lot more importance after the surgery, before the second case is taken for the surgery. And handling of the lemon, like, you know, you should not be really, uh, you should just put the linen without uh, stretching them and handle them with care so that whatever aerosol, whatever uh, the, the organism they are there, do not really spread everywhere. A couple of articles, they say that it is not just related to the spine surgery or the orthopedic surgery, but any surgery that uses the cautery, and they have the potential exposure of the, of the uh, expo, uh, potential uh, sort of, they can generate the aerosol. The measurement of the aerosol, I think the particles which are generated they are 0.5 millimicron or even larger size, one millimicron. So that is something just to share with you. The particle could be really as tiny as 0.5 millimicron. Uh, high speed cutters has been shown to create an aerosol cloud in the whole surgical room and it is found in many mobile equipments. So this COVID has probably taught us this, that you know the disinfection of the room and the mobile equipment is really necessary after the high speed use, which we have not been doing practically after the surgery. And the second case is taken over. So very important for all of us to learn about this. Now, what is best for the aerosol? How do we really, you know, sort of protect ourselves from the aerosol generated by the high speed tools? And the first thing, first thing that comes to anyone's mind would be N95 mask. And second is N100 filter, which we have been using and which we have used in our cases. Uh, this is something which I would like to share. The coronavirus is 0.125 micron. So the N95 mask is 0.3. So that is again for eight hours. So this N100 filter, which we have used with this full mask or even the half mask helps us in really fighting. And this is the N100 filter. So we, I did corpectomy yesterday, day before yesterday rather, and we use this for three hours. And this N100 filter is something which is the ultimate uh, uh, for this uh, aerosol uh, protection. And it was quite comfortable when I used it. So something just to share with you, what is required is something like 6800 mask uh, that really helps us. Now, what I will have is few questions with all the faculty. So I'm going to have you all live in the, in the, in the webinar. And we will have a few questions discussed. And there are a couple of questions that has come into the, into the question box.
Yeah, my question to all the four faculty, uh, since we have learned this tool does the best job, Sajan. Does the best job and you know, probably we'll have the hang of it. Suppose in the middle of surgery, we found that, you know, this is not working. How would you tackle Sajan? Uh, that will be a nice situation. That's why you should always have two of these. And I've been asking my hospital to buy a second one. Uh, I don't like getting caught in these kind of situations. Uh, I don't like suddenly changing from one, what I have planned to doing something else. It disturbs me. Yeah. Uh, so I like things going in a smooth way. But uh, to your question, we would have to revert back to our old instruments, osteodomes, the trusted osteodome, the kerosens, but uh, I wouldn't like to be in that situation. Yeah, thank you. What about Ajoy? What would you do? <laughs> Fortunately, we have two sets of Masonic bursts, and therefore we never had an issue where it. <laughs> I need to change the plan because of the not acting of the Masonic burst. That's yeah, one thing. Yeah. But having said that, I still use a lot of burst. Therefore, I am not very uncomfortable using the burst. But as Ajay mentioned, if he's doing an internal sculpting, then I think it will be a difficult scenario. Yeah. You can't have a substitute for that. It cannot be matched by a bird by any uh, means. You can do it, but it technically takes you off. Yeah, sure. Babuk? So, uh, so we have just one set of uh, ultrasonic bone scalpel and we are planning to buy the, the other one. As uh, the previous speakers have said, it is essential to have two sets. The problem, you know, uh, which we encounter most commonly is the breakage of the, the tip. You know, what happens, uh, like the, if you're using these tips again and again for uh, more than two cases or three cases, then these tips, they break, especially the burr, because it is very hollow and it is, uh, you know, it's very fragile. So after, say, one or two cases, then it breaks. And in those cases, we just change the, uh, the, uh, the working tip. Yeah. Uh, Ajay, um... If it breaks in the middle, you know that we have two bar, but at the same time, we had one bar to begin with. We, we have one, one uh, uh, console to begin with. Um, if you can unmute yourself, I... As, as, we, as the home thing should not be talked outside, but it would be Bharat sir who would stop me from using the bar frequently and I, I'm a damn fan of the thing. So we have two, two machines. We have four handsets and uh, frequently we have got few of them serviced and damaged as well. <laughs> we have a hospital which I uh, go say weekly once on Wednesday for doing a, a, a practice there and that is far away. In that hospital also, even for that one day I have procured one Masonic because I'm just used to it now. So you got addicted to it. I can't just uh, do without I, it. Now. Yeah. I agree with Ajay. The same thing for me. When the table is set now, there will be a burr and there will be Masonic. <laughs> I cannot, irrespective of whether I am doing a decompression or anything like that, you're just used to it because it helps you to make your surgery faster. Number one, the most important thing of using a Masonic is that you are decompressing from outside in. And you can remove the bone using a small probe so that your neural injury or a neurological worsening, especially in a OLF or situation like that, is significantly less. In our analysis, we find that the incidence of neurological deficit is significantly lesser in OLF patients with Masonic when compared to our time when we used to do it before Masonic. Yeah, sure. Uh, the, my next question is, uh, what are the cases where you would refrain, you know, you would not use this bone scalpel? The question to Sajan, please. I think for all of us, the same question. What are the cases where we do not use the bone scalpel? Frankly, I, I cannot think of one, Bharat. Uh, I, in fact, see more and more applications rather than less. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, I, I, I really can't think of something where I would not use a bone scalpel and use something else instead yeah. of. Yeah, I mean, when I started propagating this particular technique and, you know, the started showing the cases from C2 to L2 laminectomy in just one go, people started talking about, you know, you are doing the indirect decompression, this and that. I tried to justify, but, you know, there are, there are things, you know, which you can't really 
put it forward when people not large, you know, not many are using it. Uh, Ajoy, is there any case where you would not do? No, definitely not. I agree with the Sajan on that aspect. And I would say the only instrument which you can use very comfortably near the Dura is a Mison. Yeah. It's an ultrasonic cutter. Like now you have done a decompression. Uh, for example, you, you have to remove the bone, which is you think is slightly left behind. I'm very confident of using a Masonic very near the Dura. Mm -hmm. And I cannot use an uh, osteotome so confidently, cannot use a burr at all. And using an upcutter is probably you're causing more damage. Than that. Yeah. You see, typically, typically these bone spurs yeah. are sitting in front of the nerve root. Yeah. You can do a gentle retraction and go with those. With, yeah. with we, yeah. you, you know, in the past, we have, uh, we would, having no other go, we would use the regular burrs with horrendous uh, issues. You know, so I, you, this is very, very useful in that. Yeah, sure. Um, the undercutting is something which is a beautiful tool as well. When you have certain situations where you know the the bone which will protect the nervous tissue as well. Babuk, any case that you would not use this? So, like um, the previous speaker said, you know uh, we have used this in so many cases, uh, maybe hundreds and this thing. So, our, for us, you know the applications are expanding. But the one who is just starting and who is not using this thing. So there are certain cases in which I will advise them not to use them. Like in revision cases, the cases where the Dura is adherent. So first they should familiarize themselves with the feel, uh, with the tactile feedback. And once they are confident, then only they should venture into these cases. One indi one indi uh, uh, the indi when a, uh, another indication is, you know, where you can see a calcified vessel. And if you're planning a three column osteotomy and that calcified vessel is very near to the uh, you know to the anterior uh, border of the, uh, of the of the vertebra in those cases you should be very careful that you may not just go into this thing and you can puncture the the calcified vessel yeah, great great ajay uh, there is conceptually a little bit of things which is different once you are starting starting to handle the dural tears by the mesonic and uh, what you get the major dural tears here if at all it is to be there it is usually a linear one which you can repair also but evulsions are the things which can happen once you are through a calcified dura. And here, conceptually, I would try. To, I would like to say off mic because it will be contradicted by most of the people. I started doing many of the cases planned durectomies, wherein it is extensively calcified, wherein you know that it is adhered. You try to separate out the first go, and once you know that your handling is going to cause problem, so you put a nick. You excise the dura and the whole of the thing instead of manipulating and creating more injuries. See, conceptually and traditionally what has been trained and what everybody does is that create a dural tear. If at all is there, you repair, you reinforce, you use more gels, glues, everything. I mean, that is not the way probably I learned or we got trained and it becomes difficult for this group of patients. So even with extensive durectomies in dorsal level, it has not created any problem except for few days of delayed discharge which we have had. So this is also there. So even in SA, SA for lumbar, it may create problem because lumbar it is rootlets which may just come out like a spaghetti. So it have, you have to be more careful and you should avoid actually. But in dorsal, in practice, I've done this, which I would say it is off order and it needs actual stratification and publishing before I can say that that's a method. Yeah. Uh, question to again to all. Uh, we have come across two major complications. One complication is the multi-level OLF and we have not been able to separate the dura and that is where I am sure that comment of decompression or lifting the laminectomy without really indirect, I would say. That is something that can cause the dural tear. And second complication which Dr. Ajay has shown is the pneumocranium. So how frequently you come across both these complication? One is damaging the dura, lifting the dura along with the lamina and the pneumocephalus. Over to question to Sajan, please. So uh, if you're doing the, like in a myelopathy, and you're doing it from the front, and you're doing an indirect decompression, you're actually avoiding going right down, and yeah. you invariably have uh, issues, you know, uh, dural injury, of uh, dural tears and all that. 
which in the cervical spine you find it very difficult to 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 suture or to close so uh, this indirect form of decompression which uh, i think ajoy showed or he showed where you burr out uh, for about a, a little bit uh, of the two vertebrae which you then raise up and indirectly pull up the create the space in the in the spinal canal so that you're not going inside at all you're just create an indirect uh, decompression so that we yeah. to avoid otherwise in severe opll if you try to remove everything you end up with severe problems yeah i'm i'm talking about the olf ligament of levum ossification of ligament of levum oh you mean in the thoracic spine yeah in the thoracic spine yes uh we, well we do it with our neurosurgery colleagues and we do it with a high power microscope but invariably there are tears there invariably uh when we i mean you have to expect dural injury dural tears which are okay. difficult to suture sure. which you need to patch up sure and pneumocephalus that we haven't seen okay we have ajay sure thank you ajay uh, yeah, the while uh, the pneumocephalus we had seen earlier in our practice we have seen the similar like you two or three cases actually the patient does not have it on the day one he says on the second or third day that he hears a whoosh sound which goes from the spine to the head and he starts getting disoriented and uh, this has been attributed in the literature to the suction drain that is kept drain yes yeah, that has been attributed in the literature that there is a leak when they are uh, cleaning or emptying the drain where the air can leak into the spinal canal and into the csf but usually you give hyper oxygen etc is done regarding the dural tear incidents what i have found in my experience is that once i started thinning the lamina and then cutting it i found that i can separate a plane between the dura sometimes the dura comes up the arachnoid remains intact because the piece which i am removing is not a thick piece when you got a thick piece as you are removing there is usually dura peels off but does it cause a consequence usually no and actually i mean sometimes you find the dural tear patients may do better than the patient who didn't have a dural tear i yeah. don't know whether it improves no, no. same same observation which we have in the fact in the fact we are relieved when we see that dura is completely off yes. and you can see that you know the, the and then the most important thing is csf doesn't leak when there are major dural tears yes. as well i agree yeah. with you and ajay in the fact that my primary aim is to decompress if yeah. the dural tear happens during the process let it happen i am not going to yeah. stop because i think that the dural tear is happening i don't like the aspect of floating because i believe in olf it cannot float no and that's my understanding that the bone which is indenting onto the cord will remain like that and it doesn't allow those uh, cord to float yeah babu yeah same here i haven't seen any any pneumocephalus um, i haven't seen in my practice and dural tears they happen and they are usually of no problem uh, whenever we are managing these cases yeah Uh, any Ajay, do would you like to give any thought about you know because he has told about the suction, Doctor Ajoy told about the suction which we have all the time worried about. It is a typical observation what he mentioned, and it is the suction drain only which is the reason for. Yeah, uh, we we were thinking of Ajoy. We were thinking that you know there is lot of air which also along with the fluid going into. The 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 canal and that may be one of the reason because when you look at the dorsal spine, the pneumocephalus occurs at the D12 level if we have operated, it goes right up to the up to the cranium. We don't know. You know. We don't understand. But I think it happens usually after the second or third day. Yeah. It doesn't happen immediately. Yeah. And uh, one more thing regarding Sajan's demonstration of doing a costectomy. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it should be done like how Sajan does. The pleura has to be sep completely separated. Yeah. If not, even if you are using this one, there is a lot of fluid, and yeah. it can collect inside the pleural cavity if there has been a small rent. Yeah. But yeah. Sajan has nicely demonstrated that he separates the pleura. Absolutely. There is a significant gap between the rib and the pleura. Between the two, yeah, sure. Thank Otherwise, you. the fluid can go inside. The pressure is more. It can present as a post-operative hematorrhage. Sure, sure. Um, if you have to give a message to the The, the 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 those who are participating uh, i would say that this is the miracle tool and i am sure you know everyone probably is going to use more and more and we have been seeing lot more indications coming as well 
and we use this tool for the laminectomy uh, when we do the intradural tumors as well. So we put it back. We we lift the whole lamina and then we put it back as well afterwards. Then we suture it, and we have found zero CSF leak when we do this procedure. And probably we have preserved the anatomy. So you know we are able to uh, if suppose somebody there is recurrent tumor, then we can go back again. That is one which we have been practicing since last few years. And the another thing which I practice in the corpectomy, if it is bleeding quite a lot, then again I redo the cut corpectomy cut, meaning you know about a millimeter lateral I go and then the bleeding stops. So on occasions these venous um, openings can be stopped with this heat generated uh, as well. So I do the recut of the of the corpectomy cut. Uh, in conclusion, I think the bone uh, is cut in such a way so that the blood loss is less. Uh, the Ajoy has shown beautifully about the use of the burr and the mesonex bone scalpel. I think that is something which is unique. Uh, Dr. Sajan has demonstrated very well on the bone model and as well as his cases, the grand cases and the grand correction. And really, we I feel honored and we I mean, I'm sure audience is going to feel honored as well that, you know, this is something your first webinar and probably will have you in the second webinar as well whenever we do it in next week or maybe sometime near. Um, another thing, I think it was narrated that paint brush use, uh, type of the use we should be using this bone scalpel and not to give pressure that was mentioned all the time and that is something which anybody who is started using new should not use the pressure on it. Do not remain on the same spot more than few seconds, otherwise it will burn the tissue it may not lead to the damage, but I'm sure it will lead to the blackening of the dural sac. And I think probably we can really convert this tool, which is a trusted tool from uh, osteotome and the charism to the trustworthy tool, I would say. And this bone scalpel can become the trustworthy tool and the miracle tool as well. There is a question from Dr. Maria. This, this literature suggests that there is increased temperature at the cortex. So would it cause osteonecrosis? Yes, certainly it is going to cause osteonecrosis. Anyone wants to take that question, Ajoy? Uh, question yeah, is it causes osteonecrosis, but your area of fusion where you are using is not at the site where you are using the uh, uh, osteotome. Yeah. Therefore, you are using the, your area of fusion. For example, if you are doing an intrabody, this is an access where you are removing the passage joints. It yeah. might have <coughs> certain issues, like for example, when you are doing in a scoliosis, when you are doing a ponte, your effusion is between the lamina and the lamina. It's not between the cut surfaces of the bone. Therefore, it should not have any major impact. But you have to remember, just because you are using moist cristalonic, you cannot compromise on your preparation of your bed, which is an essential part of your fusion surgery. Yeah, sure. Uh, I think question can be answered by Babu. Guru Raj has asked, can you use this for PSO? Is there a problem? No, we uh, didn't have any problem. And um, it's such a normal tool for PSO, you know, like for any osteotomy, you have to just uh, be careful because uh, the, ex the exiting nerve root has to be taken care of. And you just go in a the single back and forth movement, then there is no problem. Yeah. Uh, the, the most important thing about, you know, anything that if you use the high speed bar, that is always worry that it will catch the tissue. Here, that is not a problem. So that is why, you know, one can say that this is a safer tool. There is a question from Dr. Sarfraz for uh, Sajan. He typed this question when you were giving the talk. Dear sir, uh, is there any cardio space compromise due to change in the current anatomy position? Probably he was talking about the scoliosis case, which you had. No, I, I mean, we haven't done a study or anything, but I don't think it interferes with the uh, fusion. I don't think so. It, it causes very local, I don't know if it is, if you can term it osteonecrosis. It uh, temporarily causes uh, the, the bleeding, the normal uh, bone surface which bleeds, it prevents that bleeding. But I don't think it kills the bone. I don't think so. Yeah, sure. Um, thanks to Cure Surgical for initiating this uh, talks as well and immediate names came and I'm sure you know everyone has uh, 
given excellent input and few tips as well starting from tactile feeling not to pressure the bone and the damage is inadvertent on certain cases as well uh, thank you everybody for being part of this webinar thank you all the faculty for sharing their experience and thank you cure surgical for arranging and organizing this as well thank you and have a great evening Thank you, thank you everybody thank you thank you thank you thank you bharat bau sajan ajay thank you meeting thank you thank you thank you thank you all thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.